Good morning to this uh, last session of the research DGI research conference of the ECB. And uh, my name is uh, Ulrich Pinzel. I'm responsible for market infrastructures and payments at the ECB. And uh, this session, as the other sessions, has no title. We have uh, two papers. One is uh, on specialization in banking. The other is on the global credit cycle. But uh, I think the two have something uh, in common because um, specialization, I guess, has a regional dimension, can have one. And uh, the global uh, credit cycle has to do something with specialization or there's regional specialization. So also there we have uh, an overlap. Um, but uh, yeah, the papers are very different, you will see. And uh, let me start by introducing very quickly the four um, panelists. So the speakers and the um, discussants sitting here all in a panel now. So we have uh, Cecilia Palatore, who is a professor of finance at the New York uh, Stern uh, School, yeah, New York University Stern School. We have uh, Diana Bonfim from um, Banco de Portugal and European Central Bank and um, University of Lisbon. Yeah. So three affiliations. And then we have Nina Boyashenko from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where she is head of the um, team doing macro financial research. And then we have Stein Klassens, who many of us know for a long time from the BIS, but now uh, Yale University. So uh, let us uh, start with the first paper, which is uh, specialization in banking. And Cecilia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ulrich. Um, so thank you very much to the conference organizers for inviting me to present. Uh, this is joint work with uh, my colleague at NYU, Tony Saunders, and with Christian Blickley, who's at the New York Fed. So uh, I should disclose that the views of the paper do not express those of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. Um, so what we're interested in here is bank specialization. And if you think, like, I mean, did basically my introduction for me. You know. You, Banks are special. Banks do things that, uh, not other that not every other institution does. And in particular, banks are tasked with choosing loans, right? Just, just figuring out uh, what are um, good borrowers, how to screen them, but also how to monitor these loans. Once the loans have been made, are the loans keeping up with the covenants? Uh, are the borrowers actually doing what they said they were doing with the money? How, what, how, how do we um, keep track of where the money has gone? Right? And both of these tasks require some kind of information acquisition on behalf of the banks. And this information acquisition is costly. It's not just something that comes to banks for free. Sometimes they need to invest resources, or they may have some specialized knowledge on it. So once you think of information acquisition and you think of this information that banks need to be able to perform this task of loan selection and loan monitoring, there's a clear economies of scale that can be realized through specialization. Right? And we know that their specialization um, in, in, in banking has been documented in different dimensions. We know that this, we have relationship lending, which is basically specializing on one single individual firm. We um, have papers that show that there is regional specialization or there's specialization on types of collateral or even in some industries as well. Right? Uh, but mostly when we look at industries, at industry specialization, we're thinking of small regional banks. So what we're trying to do in this paper, what we're interested in this paper, is just looking at big banks. Like, it's like, do large US banks specialize in certain industries? That's going to be our main research question. And then if they do, if they specialize, what is it that drives specialization? And finally, like, well, if they do specialize, why does it matter? Why should we care about it? So in a nutshell, what we find is that, yes, large banks have a preferred industry. Even the large stress-tested banks in the US lend mostly, or they, they tend to prefer to invest in some industries and not others. Uh, what seems to be consistent with uh, is that banks are investing in those industries in which they have informational advantages. And we see this um, because we see better performance in the industries in which the banks are specialized. And this can be either to better screening or better monitoring. We actually see a little bit of both in, in the paper. There's evidence of both things. And finally, it's like, why should you listen to me talk for another 22 minutes? Why does it matter that banks specialize? Well, it matters because there's actually aggregate results. 
side. There's results for both bank stability and for the credit distribution. So as bank stability, we see that there's a little bit of a trade-off between returns and stability, but banks that are specialized tend to have slightly lower returns in the industry with the specialized, but much more stable returns as well. And at the same time, when I'm thinking of the distribution of credit across industries, using a little bit of evidence from COVID, we see that the, when, when banks receive this influx of deposits, that was a little bit unexpected, that was coming from, um, from all of the transfers from the government to, to the households, then they doubled down on specialization. So if you're thinking, for example, of last year's small banking crisis that we had, uh, when you're thinking of what happens when deposits shift from regional banks to bigger banks, then that's not really innocuous. It's not just enough to say, oh, money's not leaving the banking sector. If it's reallocating within the banks, uh, it, you can still see that there's effect on credit. Okay, so that's kind of the paper in a nutshell. So let me tell you a little bit of, of why do I think that bank specialization is related to information? So what are our main hypotheses that we're going to be testing or looking for uh, supporting evidence for them? So the first thing is like if you think of what's banks, what, what is it that banks do, right? Or what's the objective of banks? Banks on the one hand, they want to provide resharing to their depositors. And the best way to do that is by investing in diversified portfolios that would eliminate all interesting credit risk. And if all banks were exactly identically informed, this is what you would expect. You would expect the same portfolio being held by all banks in the way that would diversify all risks away, or the most that they can away. Now, if you think now of banks' role as information producers, then this is a little bit different because now if I have an informational advantage that other banks don't have, that would push me towards investing more or giving more loans in those industries in which I actually have better information because those loans are gonna be less risky from my perspective because I know something more about them than from the perspective of the other banks who may be uninformed about these particular characteristics in this industry. So when I think that there's a little bit of this tension between diversification and specialization and probably uh, the main driver, at least in our view, is that the more a bank knows about a borrower, then the more likely it is for um, that bank to be lending to that borrower. And again, this idea that this is going to be, uh, there's going to be less uncertainty in general, but also it's less likely that I'm getting a lemon if I know more about this industry, if I know particularly more about this borrower. Right? So there's a uh, lower winner's curse as well. So the first hypothesis that we're going to be testing is whether banks that are constrained, they, we say that they will specialize in industries in which they have an informational advantage. That's our main hypothesis, right? Now, how are we gonna be thinking of this? Well, if it's true that banks actually have an informational advantage, they should translate into better performance in the, loans portfolio, in the loan portfolios of specialized banks. So our second hypothesis is that if informational advantages are going to lead to specialization, then we should see that banks that are specialized should have better performance in their industry of specialization. Right. In the paper, we do much more. Diana had a very long appendix to look through. Uh, so, uh, but these are going to be the two main things that I'm going to be focusing today. And then I'm happy to discuss more after when, when we're in the break. So how are we going to measure specialization? We're going to use two main measures, and we've done this with a host of other measures, and all of the results are robust. So we're going to use first relative specialization, which is measuring the relative degree of overinvestment that a bank may have in a particular sector. So this is going to be the share that a bank invests in a particular industry, given all of the loan portfolio of that bank, relative to what you would expect to observe if you were to hold the representative loan portfolio in the CNI lending. Okay, so it's kind of like akin to what you would think of deviations from the market portfolio if you were thinking of assets. Right? But this, instead of having the market portfolio, we'll be thinking of what is all of the loan, the CNI lending that, that you have. We can also measure this instead of thinking in relative terms, we can think of excess specialization. We can think of, um, about the differences between these two shares. And both measures are going to give us the same results. We also use the loan count, the log amount. We also have a binary measure for whether this is the top industry for a bank or not. And all of our results are quite robust to uh, using any of these measures. In the paper, we have a long discussion of it. So once we have this measure of specialization, let me tell you a little bit of, of what the, what's the data that we, we use to, to compute it. We're going to use mostly Y14 at the quarterly frequency. And this covers all stress-tested banks in the US, 
from 2012 to 2020, we have 40 banks. It tracks all CNI lending loans of over $1 million. And so we have a lot of observations here. Um, and the most interesting thing is that we have the amount of the loan, the rate, the collateral that was used, the internal rating, the performance. We have a lot of measures that are going to allow us to kind of tease out a little bit this difference in, in information that we're proposing. Um, we're going to be focusing on term loans. We've done some on lines of credit as well, some analysis, and the, thing, the results still, still remain. We're also going to use some publicly available data on bank balance sheets and um, from uh, white skull data and 19C. And we also use SNC data for additional tests when we want to look a little bit of how robust are our results when we go down the distribution of size, right? Because the Y14, of course, is going to be biased towards large banks, but maybe there's something else that we can do by looking at smaller ones. And then for that, we use SNC data. And so let me show you what we get using this Y14 data. Uh, and we get uh, a measure of access specialization. So that's the one that I showed you where I have the share of a bank's loan portfolio in a particular industry relative to what you would get in the representative bank. Then you see the orange line there is for the top industry of each of these banks. This is the average across all banks. The gray line, which is the second one, is the second industry. And then the black line is for all other banks. Right. And you can see that there's a clear difference. Right? For the top industry, excess specialization is much larger. And this is something that's consistent across all banks. And maybe banks seem to have like maybe one or two like preferred industries. But for the rest, they're pretty close to being average. So this is a, a pattern that for, for us was, was surprising a little bit, was salient. It's like even the big banks in the US tend to have one or two preferred industries in which they overinvest relative to the average bank in the industry. Um, and also, we have a huge heterogeneity in the degree of excess specialization, of course. And we also don't have, given the measure, the, the nature of our measure, we can get, I can guarantee that we don't have all banks specializing in the same industry. It's not that you know, just one industry is large, and therefore the, log, the, the loan amount is larger for all banks in that industry. That's, that's not what's, what's going on here. Okay. So, if you actually want to look at loan performance, because like my first hypothesis was like, well, if this is driven by informational advantages, then we should see better performance in those industries in which banks actually specialize. So this is just raw data. I'm just plotting the number of loans that become non-performing in the y-axis relative to our measure of relative specialization in the x-axis. And you can see that the more specialized a bank is in an industry, the lower the non-performing rate in that particular industry. Which again, this is our first hypothesis kind of telling us, well, there may be something in terms of how much bank banks know in the industry of specialization. This is kind of like our first pass. Now, of course, we do regression analysis, which is much more detailed. And what we're going to do is to regress our outcomes, which can be exponent loss performances. And then we're also going to look at the terms of the loans. And we re regress this on specialization, and we use all of our different measures that I mentioned a few slides ago. And we include a lot of controls. And I think this is really important because we're going to control for relationship lending, for geographic concentration, or geographic specialization, for industry capture. We're going to try to say, OK, does industry specialization matter beyond all of the other forms of specialization that we know have some effect on the loan terms and the loan decisions, on the lending decisions of banks? Right. Um, and all of these regressions also account for bank, industry, loan type, loan purpose, and risk fixed effects. I'm going to point out um, as relevant that we actually have a lot of robustness on this. So this is our main regression. And when you look at this regression, our coefficient of interest is going to be the coefficient beta 1 on specialization. Right? That's going to be our main coefficient of interest. So this is not perfect. We have data and uh, empirical work. Sometimes it's messy. So I want to clarify that we are not measuring loan demand. We only have exposed outcomes. And because we only have exposed equilibrium outcomes, we cannot identify any exogenous variation in specialization. So everything that I'm going to show you should not be interpreted as causal. These are just, I think, like correlations and patterns that are relevant to understand how the banking sector works better. And I think these are interesting patterns both for academics and for policymakers alike. So just this is not that specialization causes better performance, but it's just they're associated with. 
So going to my first uh, result, like specialization is associated with improved performance in the industry of specialization. So what we do here is we have access specialization, we have the interest rate, so we're controlling for interest rate for loan amounts. In the last column, we're controlling for the share that a bank may have in a particular portfolio to control for geographics, uh, in a particular SIP to control for geographic specialization. We also think of past relationships to control for relationship lending. And you can see that in all of these regressions, even when we think of specialization as by itself, and when we start adding other types of specialization as well, we still find that there's this um, negative relation between extra specialization and defaults and non-performing loans, right? Which again, for us, it's the first um, piece of evidence suggesting that maybe these banks know, know what they're doing. That when they double down on an industry, when they invest more than what you would expect, or more than the average bank in a particular industry, it's because they're picking better loans. And by the way, we're here, we're also controlling uh, by, by risk ratings. We have risk ratings available. And so we can also kind of, uh, the internal ratings are quite standardized. So across banks, because they're, they're, they have to be approved by bank examiners. So um, we're also controlling for that in some of the regressions as well. Okay, now I told you that excess specialization in industries mattered beyond other specialization time, um, dimensions, and I want to show you that, because I think like, that's a key. Of course, extra specialization is correlated with geographic specialization, it's correlated with um, relationship lending. So what we ended up doing here is just running a horse race among all of the most traditional specialization uh, dimensions. So we have extra specialization in the first line there, and you can see we run it alone, there's a negative relation between non-performing rates and specialization as we measure it. And then if you want to look at like the, the market power, looking at the share of a portfolio in a particular industry that a bank may be lending, you can also see that's negative. We can also have geographic specialization and we also have relationship lending. All of them go in the way in which you would expect. The more a bank specializes in any of these dimensions, then the better it performs, the, 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 more, um, the, the better loans it gets. Now, what we do in column six, which I think is the most interesting, is we standardize these measures of specialization, like to be zero, one distributed, so we can actually compare coefficients. And what you can see is that the one that has the highest magnitude, it's industry specialization. So even when we control for all of these traditional, if you want, types of specialization that the literature has been talking about, we find that industry specialization matters quite a bit, and in fact, is like almost twice as much as the next one. Okay, so this is like 0.007, here's like the next one is 0.003. So this is twice as much. Again, these are, I, I don't wanna think of the magnitudes, but the relative magnitudes, because what we're doing is standardizing these measures of specialization so that we can actually think of the coefficients like one standard deviation in specialization that is uh, in, in industries would change um, non-performing rates twice as much as one standard deviation in um, regional concentration. Okay, so we also use other measures of specialization, as I mentioned above. We're measuring excess specialization, relative specialization, the share uh, in the loan bank's portfolio that an industry may represent, and also whether there's, uh, the, the particular industry is the top industry or not, and we still get the same result. So this is quite a robust result that the more specialized a bank is, however you wanna measure it, the better the loans are in that industry of specialization. Right. So, more, all, we have additional information, supplemental information uh, about some of the loans, and we can look at more evidence to figure out whether our hypothesis makes sense. And we look at performance and syndication, and we find that non-syndicated loans perform a, little, perform a little bit better than syndicated ones, which would make sense. If I'm syndicating a loan, well, I don't wanna give away the loans in, that I know are better because the market is not really going to compensate me for that. Um, we also look at constraints, like maybe you know, the specialization that we're looking at is really not driven by information, but by banks being constrained. If there's a fixed cost of me entering an industry, then I'm a small bank, I'm not gonna be able to enter many different industries and I'm gonna specialize basically mechanically. Uh, we do look at SNC data to kind of tease that out. And we do find that larger banks have a stronger correlation or negative correlation between specialization and, and, and non-performing rates. 
um, but this is still present in all of the distribution except for the very small banks. For the very small banks that you would think would be the ones that are constrained, this relationship's no longer there. Uh, and that's what we, uh, we look at. Um, and the SMEs then, we tend to know that it's lending to small and medium enterprises is quite opaque. We have less information about these firms. So it would be a sensible thing to, to observe that banks that know more about the industry are better able to discern among SMEs and they may be more willing to lend to them and that's exactly what we find. Okay. Now the question is like how do, let me just skip that because I have like five here. So uh, what is it that, why is it that banks actually, or how is it that banks actually get these better borrowers? Because I think like that's the key. I'm showing you that there's this negative correlation. Well, what is it that the specialized banks do to actually be able to win these borrowers that are better? So what we look at is the different um, loan terms and how they correlate with specialization. And we find that uh, banks that are specialized in a particular industry, in that industry of specialization, they offer lower interest rates, larger loan amounts, longer maturities, and are more likely to lend in an unsecured way. Right. And all of these things, again, point towards banks having better information about those borrowers to whom they're lending. Right. This is not just random. In the paper also we have uh, some simulations where we actually d d simulate the distribution of, of loans just if they were random and then compute extra specialization. And we see that the patterns are quite, quite different than, than the ones that we observe in, in the data itself. So I think like all of these things uh, point towards this bank specialization driven by informational advantages. We have that, again, there's more for favorable, ter favorable terms for firms that borrow from a bank that's specialized in that industry. And this holds both for newly originated and renegotiations. So it's not just driven by relationship lending, which is, was a concern when we were looking at the data. Um, and we also um, know that the loan is more likely to be secured by fixed assets and other types of collateral when, when the banks are specialized in, in that industry, which again is consistent with uh, banks needing to have some type of knowledge about the collateral that they are assessing uh, if they want to accept it. Um, and then we show, as I mentioned before, that all of these regressions are controlling for firm um, by um, capture of the industry by geography and also by previous interactions. So none of these results is driven by um, relationship lending or geographic concentration or even the market power that's associated with banks being larger in a particular industry. Okay. So in the last few minutes that I have, I want to talk a little bit about why is it that bank specialization matters. Right? Well, what we find is that there's three dimensions in which it matters. First of all is stability. Then we also look at what happens uh, when banks are, have tight tier one capital. So what happens when these banks are not doing so well? And then um, we also um, look at what happens when, when there's reshuffling of deposits. So first, specialization is associated with better performance in the industry even in times of industry downturn, right? So if I look at this, it's like, okay, if the industry is not doing that well, but I'm a firm that's borrowing from a specialized bank, I'm gonna do a little bit better than the rest of the firms in my industry. That's the first one. We look, we see that reductions in tier one capital are associated with rising specialization. So when banks are more constrained on where they can lend, they tend to go for the specialized um, industry a little bit more than the rest. Uh, and when we have shocks to deposits, the same thing happens. So either for inflows or when periods of restrictions on the lending that the bank has, in both cases, banks adjust more on the upside on the specialized uh, firms, on the specialized industry, but they also reduce the lending less in the specialized industry. Okay. The caveat here, because then, uh, that's it's a valid question. It's like, well, everything that we're doing is in a time of peace. There's no really a crisis in, in what we're looking at. And we see that there's lower returns for the banks that specialize more. So specialization is associated with lower returns, but they're a little bit more stable as well. So let me show you that. So we see that banks can actually buck industry or, or um, industry bank trends. 
You can see the average defaults in the different industries here. This is their regression without, without controlling for everything. But then we can start including um, some um, interactions. So we can look at whether it matters whether the firm, the, the bank is specialized in that industry and, con and figure out what's the industry default rate. And then we can also look at the bank default rate. And we see that this relationship still exists, right? So um, that's, that's one. Uh, the more, so um, we also see that when we have tier one capital shifts, so when a bank has tighter capital requirements, then banks gravitate towards their preferred industry. And this may be related to risk weights a little bit because they're lending like in a safer way, then it may be easier for them to do that. And that's what, what you see in these two figures. And then finally, uh, when we looked at, at COVID, we see that these inflows that were completely unexpected are correlated with increases in specialization in the bank's preferred industry. So banks increase their lending in their preferred industry when they receive the deposits, this, this inflow of deposits during COVID. And our, our view, and at least what we think that you can actually learn from this, is that just giving deposits to banks or increasing the deposits or having money leave or come into the banking sector, it's not enough to figure out what's going to happen to the credit market. We have to figure out specifically where this money is going. So the heterogeneity in, in the banking sector, it's really important in determining the conditions that we can face in the credit market. In particular, during COVID, what we observed is that banks increased their specialization during, uh, after receiving the, the increase in deposits. So um, this I'm going to finish here. What I showed you is that large banks specialize by concentrating on a single favorite industry or a few, one or two. Specialization is consistent with banks having informational advantages. We see that the banks have better performance in the industry in which they specialize, and they're able to offer better terms uh, to the, in the, the firms in those industries. And there's aggregate implications for this. And this is part of a broader agenda that both Christian and I have been tackling, and I'm happy to talk about that if anyone's interested. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you so much for the invitation to, to be here and, and discuss the, this, this really great paper by, by Cecilian co-authors on, on, on bank specialization. Uh, these are going to be my views, not, not of the ECB or Bank of Portugal. The first thing I, I want to say is to, to congratulate Cecilia, Antonia, and, and Christian, because I mean the paper has just been accepted at the Journal of Finance, so, so this is, of course, great news, and it's really well deserved. This is a great paper, so I, I learned about this. I had already kind of uh, looked into the paper, and I was kind of struggling, what, what is there that I can be uh, helpful with? I mean, the, the paper is really so mature, so advanced, covers so many angles. And indeed, I was very happy to learn that, that the paper is, uh, is, is now coming out in, in, in the JF. So, 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 well, what, what I think I can start by doing is kind of the theology of, of the paper. I mean, to tell you about, uh, I mean, how important, how impactful that the paper is and, and what we learned from it, okay? So I think the starting point of Cecilia and, 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 and the co-authors was to think about what we know about bank specialization, okay? And, and they took this question really very seriously. And I do think that after reading the paper, you, we do know much more than we would before about um, how do banks specialize, what are the implications of that, not only in terms of um, in access to credit, in terms of the performance of the loans, and also in terms of the aggregate implications. So this is really a massive, so Cecilia mentioned there's many appendices. This is really thorough, very thorough, very detailed work. And so it's a, an impressive effort to really document every single aspect of, of bank specialization in the United States. 
And so one big takeaway is that, yes, I mean, banks specialize in, in the US, and so they, they lend proportionally more to some industries than to other industries. And one reason I, I also like the paper a lot is, I mean, um, it, it, it's, it's an approach like no stone left and turn. Everything we can extract from the data about how the banks specialize, the authors go and they explore that. And so they're also very upfront, as Cecilia was here in the presentation, this is not a paper about causal effects, about having a very accurate identification strategy that allows us to derive some causal implications. But the trade-off of that is that the authors acknowledge these and they're able to take some bird's eye view and to really establish a set of stylized facts that allow us to collect all this knowledge. And so um, let me start by, by kind of summarizing what I think are the things we should remember about this paper. So the first thing is clearly that specialization is important for banks to acquire knowledge, okay? So by, by learning repeatedly to specific industries, the banks are acquiring knowledge. And so this allows banks to do better what they are supposed to do, which is to screen and to monitor borrowers. So by specializing repeat and, and lending repeatedly to these firms, the banks are able to select the best borrowers out there, and they're able to make sure they perform well throughout the lifetime of the loans. So what this means is that on one hand, you have uh, lower default rates, okay? So, so Cecilia showed us a lot of evidence on that. And at the same time, the paper also includes information about um, the fact that small firms are more likely to have access to credit if they go to a specialized bank. Uh, then another interesting fact was, was, was to see that banks are actively competing for these borrowers. Okay? So specialization is not something random. Banks try to reinforce their specialization by being very competitive and trying to attract the good borrowers in the industries on which they are more specialized. And they do this by offering larger loans, by offering them lower interest rates, and by allowing the firms to borrow at longer maturities. Okay? On collateral, the results are, are, are a bit more debatable, but, but I'll go there in a second. And then, uh, I mean, I think another very interesting finding is, is to look into what does this mean for the banks in terms of their ability to generate returns. And so specialization seems to come at a cost, okay? The fact that the banks choose to go for these lower risk firms on, on which they know a lot about means that, of course, they cannot extract as higher returns as they would if they would be taking uh, riskier strategies. And this is true, of course, in, in more tranquil periods. I will also, I will also come back to that. Because actually, when, when the authors look into some of the, the distress periods that they have in their sample period, what, do, what they find is that the banks that are specialized in these industries, they stand ready to give support to the firms in, that, in those industries when they're in trouble. Okay, so I, I will, of course, not suggest more things for Cecilia to add. There's enough appendices. The paper is accepted and, and, and very well published. So what I will try to do is to, 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 to share with you some thoughts I have on the paper and how can these inform future research and, and what else can we learn from this. And so my first set of thoughts is about um, specialization and competition. Okay, so one thing that, um, that I was really curious about when reading the paper is to try to understand if the, these firms that operate in the same industries, okay, are they competing with each other or not? Okay? Because the incentives that the banks have to lend to these firms are going to be quite different. So one thing is, okay, these firms operate in the same industry, which means they, 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 they deliver the same types of products and services but they might not be competing with each other directly. They might operate in different markets. There might be uh, different targets into, into what they do. And so if that is the case, the bank is learning something from, from, from lending to these firms that operate in the same sector and deliver similar products and services. But by lending to one of these firms, they're not necessarily hurting their, they're, they're, they're not necessarily hurting their competitors to which they might also be lending to. If these firms are indeed actively competing with each other, then the story might be somewhat different, right? Because indeed, I mean, if, if I'm, I'm going to give more loans to this firm, this is going to place this firm in a better competitive position compared to the other firms in the same industry with which um, the, the firm is competing. And if I'm also lending to those firms, then the balance might not be clear. And so there's this uh, recent paper by Hans de Grijs and co-authors about as the idea of asset overhang, which tries to explore this idea. Okay? If I have a lot of exposure to a given sector, to a given type of firms, I might want to protect my existing borrowers rather than uh, give loans to new ones. And so I think it would be really interesting 
to try to go deeper on this issue and to try to, to disentangle which are the firms that are competing to, with each other, how does competition work within the industries on which the banks are specialized. And then still on competition, I, I think it would be interesting to also look a little bit more into, into how banks compete themselves. Okay? So, so there's a lot of heterogeneity into, into uh, the, the specialization patterns of banks. But, but one thing that um, I couldn't find uh, with enough detail in the paper is to understand if, if banks compete, how often do banks compete in the same industries? Of course, there's, there's many differences, but I'm sure that in some industries there are, there's going to be some banks that actively compete there, or it might also be the case that banks really try to split the territory and each one is going to, um, to, to focus on different industries. And again, I think we could learn from going deeper on these because somehow um, th this would allow you to discuss a bit better two things that already show up in, in the paper, which is to understand what is the role of market power in specialization. Okay, so the fact that the bank is very heavily invested in this industry gives the bank a lot of market power uh, with, with borrowers from this industry. And, and, and this is something that is debated, but at the same time, you have the role of screening, which is kind of the highlight, the way you, 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 you explain the results more clearly. And so by understanding a little bit better how do banks compete and how do they share the market among themselves, I think we could learn a little bit more about these two forces that might be behind the results. Then another set of, of thoughts I have is, is about uh, linking specialization to, to evergreening, okay? So I, I think one, the, the most clear result in the paper is how, how clearly banks specialize in industries and in those industries they focus on these high quality borrowers, okay? And so then this means that uh, this, this is a low risk strategy, okay? It's also shown in the paper that this leads to less profitability. I actually think here, we, we, I mean, it would be interesting to come back to this in a few years and have a, a more complete credit cycle because of course, the low profitability uh, during a good period might be somehow compensated by also having less losses if, if, if there's really an increase in, in aggregate risk. But abstracting from that, um, I, I also wonder if there's, there could be something hidden here, okay? And, and what I mean by that is I wonder if there could be some cases where these lower um, ex post defaults, lower charge-offs that are clearly documented in the paper are somehow re reflecting the bank's incentives to be evergreening, to be somehow hiding losses in industries or on which they're already very specialized, okay? So if the bank has a very concentrated expo exposure to these industries, if things start to go wrong, well, this would be the, the industries where the banks would perhaps have more incentives to somehow keep lending onto these firms in a way that this avoids them to, to, to actually get into um, a distress situation and actually show losses. It could be uh, on the opposite, okay, uh, to, to, that, that the specialization actually discourages the banks to engage in this type of zombie lending, right? And so here, for instance, Olivier uh, de Jong has uh, a recent paper published in the Man Management, Management Science with Belgium data that goes pretty much in the direction of what you're showing here in your own paper, which is to say, well, uh, if, if the banks are heavily exposed to this industry, then they're not going to support these weaker firms because by supporting the weaker firms, this is going to have negative spillovers on the firms that they're also lending to and that are currently healthy. So again, this also touches a little bit on the competition story and I think it would be really interesting to, to go somewhat deeper on this. Um, then, then my third set of, of, of comments, thoughts, is about the, really the, the many dimensions that bank specialization might have, okay? And so in the beginning of the paper, and, uh, you start by, by asking where does specialization come from, and, and, and I think this kind of really motivates what, what you have. But then the actual evidence of, on this, I mean, you have quite some evidence scattered over the many appendices of the paper, but I think the reader would be interested in learning more about this, and maybe there could be a follow-up paper where, where this is kind of approached in with a, with a more hands-on way. So understanding uh, exactly how this works, is it the firms, and, and you were very clear here, Cecilia, that you cannot control for demand and all that, but uh, still on the same exploratory uh, level, trying to understand if it's the firms that are selecting these banks, if it's the banks that actually go after the borrowers. Um, also, I, I think it would be very interesting to try to uncover what are the differences between some kind of strategic specialization? So this is the business model of the bank and I want to be specialized in the biotech industry and so this is where I'm going. 
as compared to more random-based specialization. So the bank started operating in some specific geography where this industry played a very strong role. And so these are, these are, these are different ways of becoming specialized and, and they might have different implications. I think it's, it's also interesting to understand how this changes actually over time. And, and there's some evidence, I think, scattered again over the paper that this seems to be quite stable, but actually how stable and when is it not stable? I think this is, this is, this is very interesting. So again, I think th these are things hidden in the paper. Of course, you couldn't tackle everything, but I think there's a lot of uh, basis here for future research and, and, and to, to work more on that. And this is precisely my point. I think actually it is all this literature on specialization in, in banking is, is really um, growing a lot recently, right? And, and so, uh, I mean, very related to your work, I think, I mean, for instance, again, citing Olivia's work, I mean, uh, there's this new paper about specialization and innovation. I'm working myself on, on specialization and, and startups. Uh, there's a, a recent very nice paper by Laura Alfaro looking into specialization and global value chains. Uh, you also cited this paper by, by Giametti about specialization and control rights. And so I, actually there's, there's, I mean, something else that I would encourage the audience that might be interested on this. So Veronica Hapoport, when recently um, Philip Schnabel and Daniel Paravizini and Veronica won the, the Brattle Group Prize in Corporate Finance from the Journal of Finance. You can see online a very interesting presentation by Veronica where precisely she, uh, she, she, she mentions your paper and some of these papers here and really uh, sets the stage for all the future research we might have on this topic. And, and, and the very last issue I, I would like to raise is about, I mean, what are the policy implications? And, and I think here, here the paper is quite silent. I mean, is there any kind of um, policy, um, policy lesson that we might take from this? And, 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 and here, I, I mean, I, I think it, we, there's clearly a lot of food for thought and there's really a lot of evidence out there. So my main question here is whether we believe that bank specialization should somehow be encouraged because the results seem to be quite positive overall in terms of risk taking and in terms of financial stability and access to credit. So um, of course this makes me wonder, I mean, part of the regulation that we have actually goes in the opposite direction. Okay, so for instance, uh, the large exposures regime actually puts <coughs> breaks into how much banks can be exposed to certain borrowers or in, in some cases, some industries. Also, I mean, in terms of uh, macroprudential measures, uh, sectoral capital buffers will go, will, are going to hit some banks much more than others. And, and also, I mean, of course, in the paper, uh, the period you're covering is a relatively stable period, but there might be a negative side to this specialization if somehow there's uh, a systemic uh, event that is going to, to make some of these more heavily specialized banks particularly affected, and, and that lead to, to contagion in the system. So um, to sum up, uh, I, I think, I mean, this is a paper, uh, I started with the neology, but actually I think it's the opposite. The paper has just been published in the paper, I'm sure it will have a very long life because I mean, it's, uh, it's really a masterpiece where you document all these very important findings and results about bank specialization. So I would take it as, as mandatory reading uh, for, for whoever is interested in learning more about how banks work. And I mean, so as, as you could see, I think the, the paper itself lead, le, le, lends itself to create many other uh, new questions. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of research coming out of this. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Diana. And I, I totally agree with the conclusion. It's a great paper, but it raises a lot of questions on how to interpret it. And one has a lot of ideas on, uh, on more research <laughs> that could be done on that basis. So um, we have, uh, I think, 10 minutes for questions. And you are supposed to stand up and uh, say where you are from uh, when you are given the floor. Please. So while the mic comes, thank you so much for a very generous uh, discussion. And uh, you hit in the nail. Like, there's nothing we can say about policy because we have a very quiet period of time. And mm. you don't want to say, oh, specialization is good. It's <laughs> like, yeah, if nothing happens, sure. Uh, and then some of the research that we're doing on competition among specialized banks, we have a follow-up paper mm. that combines measurement and both data and theory that kind of looks in, into that. But thank you so much. Simone Manganelli, ECB. And uh, linking to the presentation of the previous session, was wondering if you have any evidence about long-term trends in uh, uh, specialization and whether what you see in uh, the last decade is just uh, an endogenous outcome of this secular decline in bank lending that we saw in the previous session. 
I think it's very interesting we're discussing that with Amit actually in the break. It's like we have 10 years, like, you know, uh, we don't have more. This is FY14 data. We needed uh, pricing data as well. So no, I wish we had. Hopefully in a couple of years we can say something else. For now, over these 10 years, specialization is quite stable though. There's, uh, so um, yeah, that, that's my answer. Please, yeah. Hi, I'm Itzeru uh, from Stanford. So uh, one of the things which is related to the point that discussant raised is that specialization could have <clears throat> implications when the bank fails because the willingness to pay for your potential bidders is going to be a function of whether they are specialized and that that kind of interacts with if the banks are well capitalized as potential bidders. In fact, we had looked at uh, the previous 10 years uh, around the 2007 uh, crisis. We had a bunch of failures and you find that banks that are very specialized, especially if the uh, potential bidders who are specialized don't have a lot of capital, which happens during bad times, uh, there's a huge discount in selling those banks. So I wonder if some of the returns results that you're getting is actually pricing those states of the world where if bad stuff happens, you will not be able to sell for as much potentially. So that might be worth sort of exploring potentially. I think that's a great point. So um, we can't say anything about downturns. Now, the other very specific thing about this data is that these are huge banks. So they're very, very, very heavily regulated. If you were to look at regional banks, I don't know whether the return and the risk uh, relationship that we're observing will be there, even in normal times. So that's a big caveat. It's like it's peaceful times and these are stress-tested banks. So we don't have an SBB in, in our in our data set, so that's, but it's a very good point. Thanks. You want? ECB, actually I had the same question as Simone, but maybe uh, on this you, you don't have much of a time series, but can you think of across industries whether there are differences in how tough the competition from non-banks is? Perhaps it differs across industries and whether you can do some kind of cross-sectional heterogeneity across industries on that. Maybe another question is, uh, so, so again, you looked at, uh, at borrowers and lending, but I guess banks are providing packages, right? I mean, there is also something, you know, there's a deposit this borrower has with the bank. Do you have any sense whether there is some cross-subsidization going on across different products that the bank offers different borrowers? Because, you know, you found that, you know, they kind of provide these very lucrative terms to the specialized uh, borrowers they have. Do you have any sense of what they do on the other side with other products, things? So we haven't looked at bundling. I think it's really interesting to kind of look across products and figure out where, if this is just uh, cross subsidization for something else they're charging them more for. We haven't done that. Uh, one of our students, uh, Yanis Kaposiaras, is working on actually looking at what happens after, like kind of tracing the relationship. Maybe it's an initial low return and then it starts growing up with time. So that may be another thing that's happening. Um, but we haven't looked at that in the context of this data. And on the previous thing, also whether we actually have results uh, that if you look at industries that have um, more non-bank lenders that are prevalent uh, as a share of the, of the total lending in that industry, then banks offer even better terms than they would, they would offer in, in the others. So th there's a little bit of that and who's competing against me. It's like, is, the, is it other specialized banks? Is it just non-specialized banks or is it non-bank lenders? So we have explored a little bit of those results. I think that maybe now in, are in the appendix and we're not giving them so much prevalence. But yeah. What, David? Um, my question goes a little bit in the, in the line of that of uh, Amit in the sense that if you have an increase of specialization, you might think also that uh, banks have more market power over certain industries. Um, so I would like to know your thoughts on that. I understand why 14 is 40 banks and you might not have interest rates. So have you thought about that, that dark aspect of specialization? And on the positive side, just to keep it a bit lighter, um, obviously a specialization would matter much more, much more in the direction of uh, that um, Diana was alluding to, which is on the equity side. So do you see an increase in specialization on the equity side, not from banks, but venture, maybe from venture capitalists, private equity, et cetera? Thank you. 
So starting on the second question, we haven't looked at equity side. I think it's really interesting to figure out whether there's specialization in that area as well. If the, if the intuition translates, then there should be, because there's some informational advantage when you kind of lend more in one industry. Um, anecdotally, I would say, yes, there is, because the people that I know that run VCs tend to focus on one or two industries. Uh, and uh, I think we're out of time, but I'm happy to talk more afterwards. Yeah. Um. Can I also ask a question? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, sure. so, like, I, I'm I mean, what, trying one, to stay. One intuition that I had, I mean, I was surprised by the result that um, specialized loans um, have uh, lower rates now. Because you could say, I mean, where it matters to specialize is where you have information intensive projects and then you do the work of monitoring. But you would be compensated, you should be compensated for the investment into information and monitoring. Where when you have uh, plain vanilla projects that everybody understands immediately. You don't have this cost factor, so why couldn't you have also the opposite? So relation? we're controlling for risk in our regression, so we're trying to kind of think of two projects that are as information intensive, if you want, yeah. and then see whether the specialized banks okay. do better. Yeah. Okay, so no, great paper, many thanks. Uh, and uh, you saw a lot of questions, but you answered very efficiently, so that worked out. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on then. The global credit cycle, Nina. Right. Um, thanks, for, uh, th thanks for having me and thanks for having the paper on the program. Um, this is joint work with my colleague at the New York Fed, Leonardo Elias. And again, as Cecilia said, the views are our own and not necessarily the views of the bank or of the Federal Reserve System. So the starting point uh, for our paper is to think about whether there is a global component to local credit cycles. So we're actually in some sense going to go the opposite direction of uh, what Cecilia was looking at. And one way to think about where we're starting from is to think about the recent literature on the global financial cycles and the parallel recent literature on local credit cycles. So the global financial cycle literature thinks about common variation in global asset prices. And one of the things that that literature documents is that you can construct a single factor, the so-called global financial cycle factor, um, that is going to explain a large fraction of the common variation in a range of global asset prices, so across different types of asset classes as long as well as across different countries. And that literature has shown that, at least historically, that factor tends to be strongly correlated with uh, measures of equity volatility in the US, so with something like the VIX. At the same time, uh, post-crisis, we have focused a lot on trying to understand uh, the relationship between local credit cycles and uh, local macroeconomic outcomes. And that literature tends to find that local credit growth is going to predict things like adverse future real outcomes. Um, and in particular, if you have expansions in the quantity of credit that happen at the same time as there is a compression in the price of credit, that tends to uh, pre, uh, predate even uh, worse outcomes than if you just have an expansion in the quantity of credit or you just have a compression in the pricing of credit. So one question uh, you can, uh, we're going to be interested in studying is uh, why could there be a global component to local credit cycles? So uh, if we think about what the global uh, financial cycle literature is trying to measure, one way of interpreting the factor, uh, the global financial cycle factor, is that it proxies for global risk aversion in the banking sector. Um, so uh, when that factor signals tightening, that corresponds to decreases in the quantity of bank-provided credit locally. You can also think of that factor as proxying for global risk premia so that, um, again, tightenings in that factor correspond to, or, or rather loosening in that factor correspond to uh, decreases in uh, logo uh, credit spread. Now, one thing that we're going to try to argue in this paper is that 
the global financial cycle factor is potentially not the quote unquote uh, right measure of global credit cycles. Why? Well, uh, one feature is going to be that uh, the global financial cycle factor tends to look a lot like a banking uh, credit factor or an equity credit factor. And as the world moves towards uh, less dependence on bank intermediate credit, it's potentially uh, a less representative measure of uh, cycles around the world. Um, and also, uh, we're going to argue that there is a differential pricing of volatility in equity and corporate bond markets. And so to the extent that the traditional global financial cycle factor captures a lot of equity type uh, measures, it's potentially going to be mismeasuring the global credit cycle. So what do we do in this paper? The first thing we're going to do is construct a measure of the global credit cycle. Um, I will show you a little bit of the details of the procedure, but essentially we're going to try to uh, construct a factor that's going to predict one month ahead uh, bond level returns, uh, one month ahead country level equity returns in a large panel of countries. Uh, and we're going to build that factor to be nonlinear in measures of aggregate credit spreads and aggregate volatility. Uh, from an econometric perspective, we're going to implement this procedure using reduced rank regressions. Once we construct the, our global credit cycle uh, metric, we're going to do a few things with, uh, with the factors that we construct. Uh, first, uh, we're going to show that the global credit factor is going to predict asset returns. Um, and we can slice and dice the data in different ways. So looking at specific countries, specific subsamples, predictive horizons, and asset classes. And one of the nice things that comes out is that we do have monotonic factor loadings. Um, so both within, um, and within a country across asset classes as well as across countries. Um, and in particular, that monotonic factor loading kind of looks like a flight to safety. So we're going to have lower expected returns uh, for safest, higher expected returns for riskiest, um, either asset classes or countries following um, a credit factor tightening. Um, the second half of the paper uh, focuses on trying to understand the relationship between the global credit factor and local macroeconomic outcomes. So the first thing we're going to show you is that tightenings in the global credit factor predict uh, changes in the local quantities of credit. Uh, so first, it predicts extreme um, capital flow events, in particular uh, capital flow events in debt portfolios. Um, second, we're going to show you that it predicts declines in the stock of private debt outstanding. And kind of co uh, co corresponding to what the local credit cycle literature has found, we're then going to be able to predict local real activity. And both uh, looking at the mean, so we're going to be able to predict that a tightening in the global credit cycle predicts lower GDP growth locally, um, as well as a higher probability of um, extreme negative GDP outcomes. Finally, um, I will show you just a little bit of this. We do find this predictability both in and out of sample, again, lending credibility to the global credit cycle factor that we construct. So um, just to summarize, essentially, what are we finding? So a tightening in uh, the global credit cycle is um, going to correspond to a higher probability of uh, debt portfolio flow stops. Uh, is going to correspond to a slowdown in growth and is going to correspond to a higher probability of um, quote unquote growth crises. So let me tell you a little bit about the data that uh, we're going to be using. Uh, so the main data set is going to be focusing on very detailed secondary market data for corporate bonds. We're putting together a longer history of pricing data for the US, uh, which starts in 1973 together with um, uh, global corporate bond indices for both investment grade and high yield bonds. One of the drawbacks of the international uh, corporate bond data is that it only starts in 97. 
which is why we are supplementing it with a longer um, history of US data. One of the key things that we're going to be doing is we are going to be adjusting our um, realized or predicted returns for firm level default frequencies. We get that from uh, Moody's KMB Credit Edge. Um, and essentially, uh, the default frequencies in that data set are based of a Merton model. We have a companion paper where we explain how to put all of this and um, other data on uh, international debt markets together. So uh, just to give you an idea of uh, what these returns look like over time, uh, so here I'm just showing you the um, advanced economy subset of the countries that we're going to be looking at, plotting uh, 12 months cumulative excess returns at an aggregate country level. And as you can already see from this chart, there is a lot of com uh, international co movement in these bond prices, but you do also importantly have periods where particular countries um, deviate from the aggregate trend, for example, uh, due to their particular exposure to specific macroeconomic factors that um, are not global. Um, in terms of how we're going to be constructing our uh, our factors. Again, I'm not going to go into the details in the interest of time, but let me just give you a flavor of what we're doing. So essentially, we want to think of excess returns in both the equity and uh, the corporate bond market as being potentially nonlinear functions of, um, again, a measure of equity, we're going to be using the VIX, um, and a measure of credit spreads. In practice, um, because we're working with a very large panel of returns, we cannot estimate a non-parametric function in all of our uh, return observations, and so instead we're going to approximate this generic nonlinear function as a cubic polynomial in the VIX, credit spreads, and of course the interaction terms between uh, VIX and credit spreads. We're going to impose two restrictions on uh, this expected excess return function. First, we're going to assume for, par for parsimony that there are common coefficients within a country asset group. And second, we're going to assume that this nonlinear uh, fa uh, non function actually has a flavor factor structure. So in particular, if we think about the full matrix of loadings on our full vector of the VIX, the credit spreads and interactions and powers between the two, we can think of it as um, having um, a factor structure that we're going to be estimating via reduced rank regressions. So the factors that we're going to be extracting from uh, this procedure are the factors that I'm going to be focusing on. We're going to, in particular, focus on uh, the first two components. You can, of course, think about um, extracting uh, more components uh, if you're trying to span more of the factor space. Um, just to give you some intuition for why we're doing things this way, so first, in terms of the nonlinearity assumption, from a theoretical perspective, um, if we think about the modern literature on intermediary asset pricing, we like to think of occasionally binding constraints for market participants. Uh, occasionally binding constraints are going to translate into a nonlinear representation of expected access returns. From a very practical perspective, there is a literature that shows that even for the US aggregate stock market, if you want to correctly measure the relationship between excess returns and the VIX, you have to allow for nonlinearity and that return. And so we want to follow uh, that literature and actually allow for nonlinearity and our returns. In terms of why we're focusing on common factors, and in particular on, common, on two common factors, Again, we want to think about uh, global intermediaries as pricing uh, global credit and global equity markets, but we do, again, want to allow for potentially different intermediaries for bond inequities. And again, kind of the stereotypical example would be 
thinking about insurance companies and mutual funds as pricing the bond market and maybe more traditional intermediaries as pricing the equity market. Um, in terms of the particular implementation, so as I've mentioned, we're going to be looking at a broad set of countries uh, to extract these factors. In particular, we're going to be using 13 advanced economies, nine um, emerging market economies. We're going to classify our bonds into, um, or our securities rather, into four categories. Um, the safer bonds, so those that are rated um, above triple B, triple B rated bonds, high yield bonds and equities. Again, we're going to construct these factors to target one month ahead return predictability. Uh, focusing on bond level uh, returns for the corporate bond market part, um, country level index returns for the equities, and uh, we're going to impose standard filters on the bond market, we're, and we're going to control for a battery of bond level and firm level characteristics uh, when we estimate our um, bond level return predictability regressions. So to give you an idea of the time series of um, the two factors that we extract, one of which we're going to call the global credit factor, and the other we're going to be calling the global risk factor, is that, yes, of course, you have periods in time when both of those are going to be indicating tightening, for example, during the financial crisis and the pandemic. But importantly, uh, we're going to have a lot of episodes where uh, we have significant movement in the global credit, uh, uh, credit factor, but not in the global risk factor. For example, um, during um, the LTCM episode in 97 and um, the Asian uh, debt crisis in 98, and equivalently, uh, we're, we'll have movements in the global risk factor that don't correspond to movements in the global credit factor. So very quickly, um, again, just to give you a flavor of the return predictability results um, that we get. Uh, so here I'm showing you a subset of the one month ahead return predictability results at um, the bond level, again, for the bond portfolios and uh, equity index level for equities, regressed on our two factors and um, again, controlling for bond and firm characteristics. And the way to read this table is that a positive coefficient on uh, the global credit factor is going to correspond to tightenings in global credit predicting uh, higher expected excess returns. Um, instead of staring at all of these coefficients, let me show you a little bit about this flavor of the flight to safety. So again, one thing uh, that we can show is that if you look at all of our uh, country asset groupings and you um, order countries based on the volatility of year-over-year -year, uh, real GDP growth, we kind of see that the factor loadings are going to be um, more, are going to be higher for more volatile countries and again are going to be higher for riskier assets. Or equivalently, if we look at uh, the coefficients ranked by uh, the corresponding CAPM beta for both the credit factor and the risk factor, again, we get that um, the factor loadings from our return predictability regressions are going to be increasing in um, the asset beta with respect to the market factor for each market. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we do have a lot of asset predictability results in the paper. I'm not going to take you through all of them, but I do think it's important to uh, show you that the return predictability results are not driven by the global financial crisis, they're not driven by the pandemic. So just to illustrate that, um, I'm focusing on the German triple B portfolio. As you can see in our full sample results, the global credit uh, factor has a negative 2.72 coefficient. Uh, the global risk factor has a positive coefficient. And then just focusing on the global credit coefficients, we see that they stay consistently negative except for 2020. We know that there were a lot of government interventions in the bond market in 2020 that perhaps explain uh, that change in coefficient. 
whereas the positive coefficient on the global risk factor uh, um, is only driven by the global financial cycle and the pandemic and the post-pandemic observations. Again, kind of highlighting the differential roles that the global credit and the global risk factors play in this. With my remaining time, um, I would like to show you some of the real activity predictability results that we have. Um, so again, um, the first part of the paper focuses on documenting the global credit cycle and asset prices. We're now going to first think about the relationship between the global credit cycle and international capital flows, and then uh, we're going to think about the relationship between the global credit cycle and local business cycles. So in terms of capital flows, we're going to focus on trying to predict capital flow events. Um, this, uh, the construction of the events data is fairly standard, so we're going to uh, be using quarterly data on uh, gross international capital flows to segregate it by type and the residency of assets. We're going to identify uh, quarters of extreme capital flows as in Forbes and Warnock. And for what I'm going to show you today, I'm going to focus on stops, so um, a decrease in uh, the flow of, um, in the capital flows coming into the country. Um, Again, from a practical perspective, um, these types of uh, event predictability regressions tend to be estimating using log-log uh, regressions to account for the large number of zeros. And essentially, um, the only thing we're doing is we're augmenting the Forbes and Warnock specification with, um, our, with, with our two factors. Um, so, um, Again, just to show you that uh, in terms of uh, stop episodes, we have that a tightening in the global credit uh, factor corresponds to a higher probability of capital flow stops. I have highlighted with the red box the coefficients that are unique to uh, our specification. And if we look at the full uh, time period, we see that uh, tightenings in the global credit cycle correspond to um, a higher probability of uh, stop events across all flow types. But importantly, if we just, if we exclude the global financial cycle from our, um, uh, from our sample, we f uh, which is what we're going to be calling the normal period, that predictability is going to be coming uh, through the predictability of that portfolio stops only. And intuitively, that makes a lot of sense. We're looking at a, at a factor constructed uh, to price uh, corporate bonds, and so it makes sense that the first place it's going to be showing up in during the normal times is going to be in that portfolio uh, events rather than events for um, other flow types. Um, the second exercise we're going to conduct is to think about the relationship between the global credit cycle um, and local business cycle. We're going to implement that using uh, local projections, but we're going uh, and we're going to make things harder for ourselves by also controlling for um, not only lo local measures of the credit cycle, but also uh, measures of the credit. Uh, credit cycle at countries that are connected to the country we're looking at. And essentially, um, again, what we find is that first looking at the credit cycle in quantities, um, a, global, a tightening in the global credit cycle not only is going to predict capital flow stops, but is also going to predict decreases in um, the amount of credit extended in the economy. Um, with the global credit cycle factor respond, uh, uh, acting more in the short run, whereas um, um, the quantities of credit seem to respond to the global financial cycle more in the longer run. Similarly, we can look at the reactions of uh, average real activity. So again, a tightening in the global credit factor is going to correspond to a uh, near-term effect on growth, um, whereas a tightening in the global risk factor is going to uh, 
um, have a longer term effect on real GDP growth. And finally, um, the last exercise that we do is to think about the relationship not just uh, for average growth, but also for extreme growth outcomes. And again, we find systematically that a tightening the global credit factor is going to correspond to increased probability of um, crises, which we define as declines in GDP growth, um, or year-over-year -year GDP growth less than minus 2%. Um, and um, a longer term ef effect of tightenings in the global risk factor. And so again, uh, just to summarize, what we find is that we, uh, with these results is that we have a local predictability of crisis, so crises at a country level rather than a global level by a global credit price variable. The last thing I'm going to show you is that we can redo all of this, uh, these exercises in and out of sample sense. Again, I'll just show you one of these pictures uh, to give you an idea. And essentially, we're going to do a pseudo out of sample evaluation, uh, where for each month in our sample, we're going to use the data up until then to um, estimate the factors, or estimate the factor loadings. We're then going to run the reactivity predictability, let's say, looking forward. Um, and so uh, what I'm going to be showing you is essentially a time series of coefficients using these alternative vintages of the factor construction. And so, again, just to focus on uh, the relationship with um, average real GDP growth, um, again, each point is going to correspond to the coefficient from one of these vintage regressions. Um, and the interesting thing is that the global credit factor is going to have a stable relationship with future real GDP growth, whereas the relationship uh, between the global risk factor and future and real GDP growth only has the expected sign um, uh, between uh, 2011 and 2018 when the original credits uh, a global financial cycle papers were written. So just to wrap up, uh, what we do in this paper is investigate the central role of global credit conditions in uh, macroeconomic cycles around the world. Um, and what we argue is that uh, there is a global pricing of credit, which then corresponds to um, aggregate changes in, uh, in the probability of capital flow stops at a country level, which then translates into um, a global uh, component to local credit cycles and local macroeconomic conditions. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks very much for inviting me to discuss this paper. We are very insightful. At the same time, it's also very ambitious. And, and I think you've already seen it from the presentation. We're covering quite a bit here. So I'm still at the, the moment of trying to absorb what is all going on. Uh, and hopefully my discussion, and discussion will help a little bit, uh, if not for myself, at least uh, <laughs> for you guys as well. So the question that the paper tries to address is, do global uh, credit conditions affect local credit and business cycles? So we're going from the global to the local, um, and that's where the step sometimes can be quite quick and fast, uh, because what it does is takes a formal asset pricing model. Um, that's, I'm not necessarily the asset pricing person, so I'm not going to comment that much on it, but the, uh, I, what I read of it is it's all sensible. It actually is confirming many of the things that you would expect it to do. Um, it takes that formal asset pricing model for a large set of countries, a large set of assets and bonds and equities to derive these risk factors that we typically kind of assume or somehow left implicit. And actually, see, goes beyond that and looks at a global credit factor as well as a global credit risk factor. So two separate distinct measures of risk that we may sometimes aggregate into one and call that something like the global financial cycle. Um, and then goes to the second step and asks, what does it mean for the local conditions? 
she calls that real, actually it's, it's both financial and real in the sense it's capital flows, it's financial conditions, but it's also GDP and crisis. Uh, and there she finds that the tight thing indeed predicts, and it's, it's the extreme events but where the innovation is also happening, right? So it's not that we have the medium there uh, covered, we have the tail events that we're covering in, in the second part of the paper. Um, so very interesting questions and, and a lot of praise here, relevant obviously, I mean, global financial conditions we know affects the real economy, but we, as I said, we're not always that clear about it. Uh, so here we have a rigorous asset pricing model. We are separating credit from risk. Um, we allow for these non-linearities. Um, it also takes a predictive approach. Uh, it's not like, okay, we see today something happening, there's a shock and there's a shock at the same time somewhere else. No, there is a uh, way of, of, um, of predicting here. Um, so it adds both to value in the theory uh, and as well in the practice. Uh, We've some, seen many papers, I've dabbled a little bit on the global financial cycle myself, and uh, there's, the, the literature has been uh, growing quite a bit, but it's often without much formal structure, and uh, my own work is definitely not with much structure, it's just looking at the data as they come along. Um, and here we have a much more rigorous way because we have a, these developed uh, risk factors. Um, at the same time, I think in that, that's some sense, that's why I call it ambitious. It's a little bit of a challenge to make that step, right? Because we have these asset pricing um, challenges, both in, in the empiric in sense for the paper, but maybe also in terms of placement, because we often talk to two different people, the asset pricing people and the more macro-oriented uh, people. And this, literature, this paper tries to pull this literature together. So that is uh, somewhat of, of a challenge. Um, so that's, that's my, in some sense my main comment as well, that there's many moving parts here that the reader has to work through in order to link these things. Um, uh, so let me go uh, step by step. The equity and bond excess returns are assumed to be based off the VIX and duration matches spread. That was not ex much discussed uh, by Nina at uh, given time, but nevertheless it's not an unimportant, innocuous assumption that you have to make at some point where are these risks being priced off. Um, and in this case it was the, the VIX and the duration match, but you could have thought of some other variables as well. Um, so then we go through these credit and risk factors and we do the, the non-linearities. The exposure mapping that she showed very briefly in terms of call it the betas if you wish, they map off kind of with the country and, and the asset class as you would expect. So risky countries have higher betas, uh, risky assets have higher uh, betas as well. Um, so that's very reassuring. At the same time, you find them also lining up with what we do in the simplistic way of like, let's use a financial condition index or let's use the, the LMRA index. They also line up with that. So if you really take it to the empirical level, then uh, we're not adding that much value, um, but we have the more rigorous theory that we do in it. So we need to make sure that the theory that where to which we add value is also gonna be reflected in subsequent work um, and there I think the main component is the predictability, right? So uh, in all the other work it's typically we have this factor and I explain something contemporaneously. Here we're going to actually move to the predictability because it's a risk factor rather than kind of a contemporaneous way. But then in the second part uh, of the paper we're a little bit hampered by the frequency of the observations because we're not going asset prices, we're going to the real side, and of course then things slow down in terms of observation frequency. We're gonna to go to, to the quarterly, uh, maybe even more crises that happen to come along once in a while. Um, and then particularly when we go to the episodes period, we have at the handicap, it's one observation, so we're in the zero one literature, um, or in the recession literature, the same thing, zero one. Or we have to look a little bit more continuous, but then we have to switch methodology. So we ended up with, a, in this case, a global a VER or linear projections when we talk about the GDP and credit development. So, so we're taking something both frequency-wise, but also theoretical-wise, to a different way of thinking and moving forward. So at least for me, I would like to see a little bit more laying out the steps uh, that you do, that's just a presentation issue, that would help me as a non-asset prices person in the first place. But maybe, and this is gonna be more an implicit comment for my next uh, few comments, uh, looking at the data that we're using, 
lines up along the, that logical chain of reasoning so that we start with, okay, this is an asset price shock that affects an intermediary or it's a credit shock, uh, or credit shock affects the intermediary more. And that, for that reason, affects bond flows in the following way. And then the bond flows in turn affect something in the domestic receiving country. And as a consequence, I see developments both on the real or on the financial side within that country along that same line of reasoning. Um, because otherwise, you, if you're just gonna go to the predictive um, set, you're gonna end up with a little bit more of a disconnect between these, these two parts. Um, I think it's feasible. I don't have it, however, in my comments yet laid, laid out as to what exactly that would be. I think for sure, see, there's a lot of work uh, that you didn't see in the details, but in terms of building up those risk factors in the individual bond data that Nina and Leonard have used. Um, and I think that is the way to continue on that comparative advantage in this paper to add to the global financial cycle literature. Um, it's a little bit more implicit in my comments, and let me just run through them, and hopefully Nina will be able to extract more from there what she needs to do in, in the next version of this paper. So one, I, I'm always a little bit worried, but I'm, I'm uh, uh, also doing the same thing myself, so I should be careful here. Uh, U.S. is typically taken as the core country, and I'm saying uh, things in the U.S. affects the world, but at the same time, we're gonna be measuring everything in dollars, we're gonna do the relative to excess returns, and then, hey, wait, the U.S. is very important. Oh, hey, yeah, we, but you measure it relative to the, to the U.S., so be careful on that score. Um, maybe you can do better there. Um, then this comment I made already before, get more granular, but you have a little bit of a disconnect here between the equity and the, and the bond side. On the bond side, uh, the paper used individual bond prices and used a lot of the bond uh, specific information about the borrower, so the financial of the borrower, the size, and you, you name it. Um, but then on to control for it. Um, but on the equity side, it's, it's, if I understand correctly, it's more the general index, where we don't control, of course, for all the uh, specific firm that are in that index. Uh, so maybe that disconnect is, is okay, but I'm a little bit worried. More generally, I would like to see equity and bond prices in some sense doing jointly. Um, we, we, uh, that's a corporate finance problem more generally. We, we tend to think we keep them separate, but in the end it's a firm value that is being valued. Um, and that is also a uh, practical thing, so, um, because once we go away from the big uh, countries, uh, so US, as I write there, 300,000 observations, 100 maybe for a small emerging market, a small open economy. Uh, so you have a little bit of a disconnect there in terms of identifying it. And I suspect, but I can't tell that liquidity must be an issue that hopefully you can take care of, uh, particularly for the bonds, but maybe even the equities. Then. So then when you move towards the, the, the second, um, it's predicting, um, but you have a relatively short horizon. So we have this high frequency data and then we move to predicting capital flows, but it ends up actually being more or less a month or so ahead, which obviously for policy is, is way too, too late. Um, but it's also um, something where I think in some sense you need the benchmark to be a little bit stronger established. What is the prior here? If I were to run a simple early warning exercise, early warning uh, prediction, we may end up uh, doing better or worse, uh, but show me that. Um, and then the data here is, is the, a little bit of a headache because um, we move from high frequency to low frequency, end up averaging some of the high frequency shocks to get us a predictive of what the kind of shock environment was in that one quarter um, to give, give gets us to the one zero capital flow measure. So um, I would, there I think your granularity on the bond and others would help you a lot to tell a little bit more. Now this sector, this country, this specific issue is being hampered and that shows up in this particular flow. Um, that's also why I think you should use the full spectrum of outcomes, not just the, the nonlinearity approach of the one zeros, but take the whole ones. Um, related to that, I would not so, I would not break down the capital flows always by type. Um, or sometimes I would do more, sometimes I would do less. One, on one hand, you can ar argue that the whole flow should affect the real effects, uh, because that's in the end, if I can substitute from bond to, to loan flows, then my country need not be affected when there is a, a shock in the bond market. Um, at the same time, your granularity tells, you, uh, tells me to go the opposite way, 
uh, go the bond flows very more granular and I show that that is happening. Um, but now you take a little bit of the, uh, the intermediate approach and I think that may not satisfy either way. Um, uh, data, always an issue. If you can go a little bit beyond December 22, but that's a lot of uh, extra data, I'm sure, to collect. Uh, but then we know a little bit more what happens to the interest rate rise. Um, a few things on presentation. Um, so one flow of reasoning would, help, have, would have helped me. Uh, um, show more explicitly the difference between the two credit uh, factors. Um, you allude to it, but uh, show too explicit. Um, um, you talk a lot about extreme events, or you talk in the text uh, and the charts, uh, but show whether indeed these events are show, uh, caused by the crisis. In some sense, it would be even more illustrative as you only take out the crisis and then say, well, look, look here, bang, the model works very well in this crisis and that crisis. Um, you say it does, but I think actually you should make that part of the paper. Um, there's a little bit more minor things. You, I think you can fix the, the charts and other improvements. Um, uh, I think maybe where I want to end up uh, very last is on the quantitative importance. Um, and this is just uh, to promote my own work, I guess. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we, when we look at um, the global financial cycle with some work with Genia Seruti, um, we do the simplistic one, but not as a pricey person. Well, I'm a simple person to begin with, I guess. Um, and we look at the uh, co commonality in interest rates, house prices, equity prices, credit and capital flows. So, so that's the ranking there, the 75% commonality on our score, which is just an R square score. Um, and a 60% in housing and 40 in equity. So you see already asset prices have a lot more common movement, which is somewhat along the lines of what uh, this paper shows as well. But then the other two is much more sporadic. The uh, credit and capital flows don't have that same commonality. Now, how do we link these two together? There must be some conditioning factors here that make uh, for a certain circumstances. So I'm more exposed to that price factor at a given point in time or as a given country, why? Because I have more international borrowings uh, or I have more banks that are lending to me uh, or I have weaker institutions. That differentiation can then tell me why I go from 75% or 60% down to 30 or 25% in the both, I would call the assets price side to the quantity side. And in many ways, what Nina has done in this paper is given us a very good intellectual and, and, and asset price based model to approach that question, I think now you, you can also quantify it, I think, much better. Um, so let me stop here. Thank you, Stein. Nina, do you want to react to one or two points? Of Stein? Uh, yes. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much. Um, yes, we know we have a lot of <laughs> moving parts. Um, in the paper, and that's one of the things, explaining how they all tie together is one of the things that we are um, trying to work on. One thing I want to highlight is that um, in terms of the comparison to, I don't know, like a measure of financial condition, uh, standard measure of financial conditions or the standard measure of uh, financial cycles, when we uh, look at e either return predictability, which we can do very granular, or if we look at uh, real activity predictability, um, our measures tend to outperform and they tend to drive out these uh, more um, standard metrics. Um, and then I think it's a question of um, the application that you're looking at, the extent to which uh, you can get away with doing a simpler approach and get some of the intuition or uh, whether you want to try to be more careful in uh, measuring risk prices and uh, follow the approach that we take. Um, but um, again, thank you very much. And Thanks. Floor is open then. Jerome. Thanks a lot for the paper. Jérôme Henry, European Central Bank. I have some like follow-up points in a way, as it appears, to, to the discussion. The first one is whether on the quantitative contribution at the country level, you add some information on the contribution of the idiosyncratic parts. So what is global risk? What is 
global uh, credit and what is the rest? So don't you have in some countries, for instance, where corporates are very much subject to sovereign shocks via their own risk premia with something that comes on top? can happen in Europe in particular, also related to the discussion point on, on the US validity of the analysis, then I'm, I'm wondering whether you had this information or if you did not, I think it would be worth having for some countries in particular, non-US, the, the, the contribution. And the other thing is, uh, I mean, the, to put it in a nutshell, the conclusion whereby uh, if you have, like, going the other way around, not sure it's symmetric because you have no linearity, but looser credit cycle position would imply lower risk uh, of crises going down the road, which is totally contrary to the early warning indicators, which is also using a, a predictive approach. So then my hunch on this would be, and would like to hear you on this as well, is that probably having the focus on the price rather than quantity things uh, could be somewhat misleading, because at the end of the day, maybe credit would have its own dynamics relatively or very even independent of the, the commonality. Again, I think we have part of the answer maybe uh, to what I'm saying now from, from the discussion. Thanks again. Um, thank you. So uh, first in terms of uh, the contributions between uh, local pricing and uh, global pricing of credit, right now we're, um, we're not looking at the local pricing component in terms of uh, the real outcomes. We do, of course, control for the local quantity of credit in the economy. Um, yes, uh, we can try to also, we do have the data to also add a local uh, pricing component. It was a judgment call in terms of how much complexity to add to the paper. Um, in terms of the um, uh, crisis predictability results, I think it is important to uh, keep in mind not just the sign of the coefficient, but the horizon. So we know even from the local um, credit cycle literature that initially, while credit is expanding, you are actually predicting better outcomes. So this would be consistent with what we're getting. Um, and a, in the specifications where we're controlling for both our factors as well as um, local and uh, trade partners' expansions and credit, we don't get a lot of effect from the pricing factors in the longer term. We do get the standard um, coefficients from the quantities in the longer term. I don't see further questions, no. Okay, then thank you very much again. And then uh, Luc, uh, Luc will close the conference. Yes, uh, thank you, Ulrich, and uh, thank you all for being here with us. Um, I wish you already very good sleep on the plane for some of you. Um, I'm quite tired myself, which is either a sign of age or it's uh, that uh, the program committee did a very good job in selecting a bunch of very exciting papers that. Uh, kept my brain working very hard. And I think uh, that's where I would like to start. Thank the program committee, above all uh, Bartosz, uh, but also Laura, Melina, Kallen, and Alex, and uh, Justina um, for selecting all these wonderful papers uh, and the keynote, above all. And indeed, uh, Justina, I have to mention uh, at least twice, Justina and Raquel are here in the back, and uh, as you know, it's a bit like putting a movie together. The glory goes to the movie director, but you know, behind stage, it's someone else doing the job, and this year it was Justina. So thank you. And yeah, just like with movies, that's normally the movie credits, they will go, and at least I sometimes I enjoy watching them. I won't hold you up very long. But it was indeed a long list of uh, colleagues that helped this year, from uh, communications, the multimedia team, the audiovisual teams. Um, so we have Florian, Sarah, Anja, Nasser, um, Patrick, Kai, David, Martin, Jan, Thomas, Tony, Vera, Anna, Isabel, Federico, and Laura. I'm sure I forget someone. Um, but in, indeed, all of them had different names. I think that's actually low probability. Um, and then we have uh, our beautiful trainees, 
the trainee students that had um, the maybe not so gracious job of going around with the mics. But I hope we'll make up with uh, some good recommendation letters later in the year. <laughs> so with that, uh, it was a pleasure. Safe travels. Hope to see you back next year. Thank you.